Hi, my name is Jaza. I'm a pianist. And in this video, I want to share with you five easy classical pieces that you shouldn't skip as a beginner. In each piece, I will play the start and briefly explain to you from a teacher's perspective why these are great pieces to work on. All five pieces I've selected in this video are fun, beautiful, and famous. And on top of that, you will also learn many musical skills and concepts that will later help you to play even harder stuff in the future. I will count them down from the easiest to the hardest piece, so make sure you stick to the end to find out what number one is. Okay, number five on the list is... And so on and so forth. So number five on the list is the Bach Prelude in C. Now we all know this is a beautiful piece, but let me share with you why it's a great piece to study. The piece is in C major, which means there are not too many black keys. It does change keys every now and then, so there are a couple of sharps and flats. But basically from the start to the end, most of it are white keys, so a great piece to learn for a beginner. It's also filled with repeating patterns. So if you looked on the score there, it's filled with this arpeggios pattern and it's like that basically throughout the entire piece just with different notes so you learn one pattern and you apply it to basically the entire piece so quite a good little piece to start for beginners this piece will also teach you a lot about chords so this piece is filled with broken chords. So th this first one here, if you were to play it all together, this is actually a C major chord, right? It's just broken up. And the next one is a D minor seven chord on, with, with seven in the bottom. Now, if what I'm saying doesn't really make sense to you, it doesn't matter, but it's still good to start playing pieces and just get a feel for chord shapes on the piano. So great for learning chords, the Bach Prelude in C. Okay, moving on to number four on our list. Number four is... so on and so forth. So this one is the Gemnopedi number no. one by Eric Satie. As you could hear, a really, really peaceful and calming piece. I always love playing this after coming home from a stressful day of work. It just really calms me down and it makes me feel happy. So aside from creating beautiful music, what this piece will really help you to do is also develop a sense of volume control between your two hands. So in piano playing, most of the time, right hand is playing the melody and left hand's playing the harmony, right? So right hand generally needs to be louder than the left hand. So for, let me show you, okay? For most of the time when beginners start to play this piece, they play something like that. So how did that sound to you? Hopefully you can pick up that the first time of playing in this video was a bit better than the second time. And that's because in the second time of playing, the right hand and left hand was playing at the same volume, which is not effective for this piece, right? If we play them at the same volume, the left hand sort of covers up the right hand. All right, so this is not good. The right way to do it is Let's say you're playing at out of 10. This might be playing at a level seven out of 10 for the right hand. And left hand, you should probably play at a, maybe about a level three. So something like that. Much softer. 
just in the background, right? And try to really bring this one out. Did you hear that? So a lot nicer control there, a lot nicer balance there. So this is what this piece is really great for. Just trying to build a nice balance between your different hands. Okay, moving on to number three on our list. So we all know this one, this is Fur Elise by Beethoven. Now, what is this piece good for? I think the Fur Elise is really good for legato playing. Now what's legato? L-E-G-A-T-O. Legato playing means smooth playing, which means connecting each note to the next note. So for example, this is legato. This next one is not legato. So as a beginner pianist, one of the things that is really important to develop is a really good legato playing, right? So how to join. So legato playing is not easy to master, right? Because you're dealing with really, really fine movements. So legato playing basically is you want to play a note and as you strike the next note, then do you lift the first note up and you're dealing with this sort of millisecond fine tuning. So. So Fur Elise is really good for building a good sense of legato playing. So Fur Elise is also really good for working on a piece that moves around the keyboard. If you're a beginner pianist, you might find that a lot of your pieces are sort of confined to a position. So for example, in C position, right? Something like that. Um, and Fur Elise is really good for just basically widening your range, right? Giving you something to work on that widens your range. So for example, uh... do you see that? So the range of the notes you need now start from this E up to that E over there. So just a nice piece to start to extend your range from these confined, simple positions. Now, moving on to number two of our list. This one is personally my favorite one out of the five. Number two is... so forth. So number two on the list is the Chopin Prelude number four in E minor. This is a fantastic piece to work on because it will teach you lots about chords. So you could see here from the sheet music that the left hand was playing a whole bunch of these three note chords, right? That are just so hauntingly beautiful. So it's really great for the left hand to learn these chord shapes. Now, one of the challenging things about this piece is because the left hand is playing all these three note chords and the right hand is playing just a single note melody, 
it can be hard to balance the volume of your hands, just like the gymnopedie example that was mentioned before in the video, right? So most beginners might start to play something like that. So as you could hear there, this wasn't a very polished sound because there wasn't a nice balance between them, right? The left and right hand were playing pretty much at the same volume. So what we want to do is just to refine our touch a little bit. So this may be playing at level seven, this may be playing at level three. Stand out more. so on and so forth. And moving now to number one. And number one is this piece. so on and so forth. So number one on the list is Moonlight Sonata Movement 1 by Beethoven. Now aside from the absolute beauty of this piece, there are also some great educational benefits of learning this piece. The first one is chords. Now in this particular piece, it's the right hand that are, le that are playing the chords. So if you were to, you know, at the start, there are these broken chords. If you were to join them together, it's a great piece to just It's a great piece to learn to understand these chord shapes on the piano. Another great benefit of learning the Moonlight Sonata is the right hand split voicing. Now this is not easy to do, but it can be a great challenge. So towards um, bar five here, so you have your... I don't know if you can see what's happening here. The right hand is sort of like playing two voices. I was playing that a lot louder than this inner voice of. So just have a look again. So not easy to do, a really great and educational challenge for beginners. And last but not least, the Moonlight Sonata is in C-sharp minor, which means it has four sharps to begin with. And even throughout the piece, there are lots of sharps throughout. So this piece in particular for me, when I was learning as a child, it really made me more comfortable with sharps. They used to scare me a lot, but after working on this piece, I got more comfortable with key signatures. And of course, in particular, C-sharp minor and knowing what sharps to play. So knowing which are black keys and which are white keys. Okay, and there you go guys, that concludes the five easy classical pieces that I think no one should skip. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you seven things I would do differently. I want to save you the months and painful years of figuring out these mistakes so that you have a, a much nicer and smoother experience learning piano. I'm gonna start from number seven and work my way all the way to the most important thing number one at the very end. So make sure you watch this video until the very end. Number seven is to learn more music theory. And I think it's really important to learn more music theory because learning more music theory means you're gonna get a lot better at sight reading. Because when you learn music theory, what you're learning is a whole bunch of uh, scales and key signatures, arpeggios, time signatures, and all these things, they just really help you to see music with quite a different lens. I'm gonna use the Mozart C major sonata as an example. If I had lots of music theory knowledge, I could first see that the right hand, that first three notes there, 
it's just a C major triad chord, right? And the left hand is... It's a bunch of Alberti basses. So that's a C major, and that's the 5-7 inverted. Okay, and then the chord four, so... So when you have a good deal of music theory knowledge, you start to be able to chunk information and you stop to see music as individual notes, but groups of information that you can then process and play much, much faster. So when you see someone sight read a really complicated and amazing piece, and they do it really, really well, they're not, it's not so much that they are really good at computing and playing many many individual notes but it's more that what's happening in the brain is they have played that particular group of notes or that cluster of notes so many times that in their minds it's just they're just performing one thing so i've never learned this piece officially before but before this video i took about half an hour just to study and analyze this piece so this is kind of half sight reading and half practice for me so if you look at this one So I want to share with you, right, what's going on in my head to play this. I'm not actually thinking about these notes as individual, like D, B, D, G, B. I'm not quite thinking about that. I'm more actually chunking it all into sort of one thing, but they're just broken up. That's a G chord, right? C chord. different chords. G chord again. Even that. So for me to see this happen, all I see is the A minor chord. But it's just got this grace note before it. Right? That's the main bit. But it's got a grace note in there, so... So number six on the list of things I would tell my younger self to do would be not to only practice it until I get it right, but more to practice something until I can't get it wrong. So this is quite a rookie mistake that lots of people make that, you know, they play something uh, many, many times wrong and they, they sort of get one time finally after an hour, they finally got it right and they think, oh, awesome, I finished my job. But it's, it's not quite so simple. It's, you know, it's if you've got it wrong 99 times and you got it correct one time on your hundredth time, well, statistically, when you're on stage, you're more likely to still stuff up because you play 99 times wrong and only one time correct, right? So it's quite important to play it many, 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 many times correctly. So this is something that I tell a lot of my students. Practice until you can't get it wrong okay going to number five is i would stop using so much pedal during my practice i think pedal is really really good for certain pieces of music when you use it in performances it's very effective but when you're practicing it's better just to not use it uh, and just focus a little more on clarity okay that's very, very important when you take away the pedal it makes your music very naked and that's better because then you can see which areas you need to improve on. Because the thing is, if you use a lot of pedal in your practice, it covers up a lot of your mistakes and uh, you don't really realize they are mistakes until you, you know, record yourself and realize, oh my gosh, I'm not even playing half the notes. So take away the pedal, it'll do you many, many wonders. So number four on the list is to record yourself playing much, much more. Here's a thought that came to me recently. When you are practicing or performing about 80% of your brain's energy is spent at trying to get the right notes, the right dynamics, the right articulation, so on and so forth. And only about 20% of your brain energy is allocated to listening to yourself, right? So because only 20% is allocated to listening to yourself, sometimes you don't realize 
there are certain parts that are not so clean or maybe you're not actually playing some notes correctly, okay? Uh, it's really important to record yourself because when you record yourself, you can listen to yourself from an audience perspective. And if you think about an audience member, an audience member spends 100% of their energy simply just to listen. They're not worried about playing wrong notes, right? So it's so important for you to record yourself and listen to yourself as an audience so that you can spend 100% of your brain's energy analyzing what are the things you're doing well, what are the things that need better phrasing, what are the things that need to improve. So for example, something that comes to mind when I'm practicing this is this trill over here. So. This one here. I currently think I'm not playing it as clean as I can. So as I'm playing right now, I am using about 80% of my energy to get the right notes, get the right phrasing, articulation, so on and so forth. And this trill is, is for me, not so good yet. So what I should do in a second is watch this video you're watching right now. I wanna watch it again, analyze my playing, and then try to refine it later. Okay, number three on the list is to follow the fingerings I see on the page. So one of the beginner mistakes that I see many people do is they play with very random fingerings, okay? So sometimes when I see students play certain pieces, they can play five times and five of those times they're using different fingerings. And I, it's just bizarre to me, right? Because what you wanna do is you wanna establish the same fingering throughout your playing so that you build the correct muscle memory and that helps you to memorize the piece faster, which means you play the piece easier as time goes by. Okay, so it's important to use a fingering. And the other note is that um, editors, they often have analyzed. So if you use sort of good additions like Henley or Peters or Paderewski, these editions have been edited by very professional pianists. So they're usually done in a way that makes the whole playing experience more effective. So that's something I would tell my younger self, I would follow the fingerings a little bit more strictly. Number two on the list is to practice more consistently. Now I know that sounds quite cliche, but this really is one of the factors that will turn you from good to great, okay? So you can see how if you simply are practicing and just improving by 1% every day, you're gonna gain huge, huge results. Getting down to our final thing now, and the final thing is to practice slower and more mindfully, okay? I think too many people play a little too fast in their practice. It's so much better if you could just slow things down, focus on the small details as you are practicing. That's what practice is for. Practice is not for performing. Practice is for practicing, which means honing down on small little details so that when it's performance time, you can do a magnificent job. Just a thought I had recently, playing slow and playing fast is actually very similar things because the only difference with practicing, playing slow and playing fast is the amount of time between each note gets shorter when you play fast, right? So let's say we go into this one. So, um, right, that's essentially the same thing as The only real difference is that the time between each note gets shorter when you play faster. So I recommend if you're practicing, let's say this piece, to practice it much slower and try to make each note sound crystal clear. So the worst thing you want to hear is something like this. things to hear in a concert so okay so make sure you're practicing slowly and with quality and there you go that sums up the seven things i would do differently if if you're wishing for faster piano progress, this video is for you. Today, I wanna to share with you five bad piano habits that I see beginners make all the time. Mistake number five is always practicing hands together. What 
what I just did is something I see beginners make all the time, which is they always practice hands together. And because they do that, they're not able to isolate where the problematic areas are. Whereas instead, if you were to work on them hands separately, before you then put it together, much, much better. Your brain will thank you tremendously. Now I get why you love practicing hands together. It's because, well, that's how the original music sounds. But if you actually want to improve your playing of those parts, you need to help your brain by separating your hands, master each hand really, really well before you put them together. There is something I love to say to my piano students, and that is that in piano, one plus one equals five. What does that mean? What I mean is in piano playing, the hand coordination that you need to execute a piece or a song really, really well is actually many levels higher than just mastering two hands. You can't sort of just jump in and play hands together perfectly straight away. A much better way to go about it is to practice right hand really, really well, left hand really, really well before you put them together. Bad habit number four is always using the pedal. Now I get that practicing with the pedal just feels a lot nicer and sounds a lot better because it's got this kind of surround sound effect when, when you use it. But especially in the learning stages of your piece, I recommend you to actually not use it very much at the start. People often say piano playing is a very difficult task because you've got to coordinate two hands. When you always add the pedal into your music, you're not only coordinating two, but three limbs, hand, hand, and leg. The point that I'm sharing now is something similar to the point that was shared before, and that's talking about this concept of isolation. If you want to get better at a specific part, it's really important that you isolate that part as opposed to trying to juggle 10 balls at once. Bad habit number three is not practicing daily. Let me break this one down for you. It seems very sort of common knowledge, but here's why this is important. A key element to your piano progress is something called sleep. Without getting too much into the science of it, every time you practice piano and you then go to sleep, your brain transfers your knowledge learned and your experiences into long-term memory. So it's really important, whether you're learning the banjo, learning how to cook, learning a new language, to do a little bit every day because you do a little bit every day, you sleep every day, you become stronger a little bit more every day. For example, if you're learning a piano scale, if you simply did just two minutes a day, two minutes of running the scale up and down, so two minutes a day times seven days, that gives you 14 minutes. By the end of the week where you've done two minutes a day, you would have mastered that scale so much better than if you just did the entire 14 minutes in one day. Huge achievements are made up of small steps along the way. So give this one a try. Bad habit number two is relying either too much on memorizing or reading sheet music. In my experience as a teacher, there are two main kinds of students. There are students who love playing music through reading sheet music, and there are students who love playing music through memorizing notes without the sheet music. Which of these groups are you part of? Let me know in the comments below. Growing up learning piano, I always was more of the second group. I would hate reading sheet music and sort of read something once or twice and immediately try to commit it to memory so I don't have to read the sheet music again. The problem with that was I didn't work on my sight reading very much and that actually capped my level after a while. I realized I couldn't progress much further in piano because my reading was just not up to my standard of technique. So it's really important whether you are a huge reader or a huge memorizer, that you actually do the opposite and build the opposite skill. And now moving on to our number one piano bad habit. The number one bad habit I see many beginners make is practicing too fast. <laughs> This is what I see a lot of students do. They learn the notes, they start practicing slowly, and then eventually they can play it pretty fast. And when they can play pretty fast, they never go back to the slow practice. So after a while, they actually play these notes on autopilot mode, and they're not actually conscious and mindful about the notes 
that are happening anymore. So over time when they are asked to play that passage, they can play something like this. It's unclean, it's not on time, it's a little bit messy. I recommend you at whatever stage in your piano learning to always go back to the slow practice. Why slow practice? To always be conscious of what is happening with our fingers on the piano. I might even go slower than that. This one. This one. After practicing slowly for about 10 to 20 minutes, I can guarantee you, you're gonna play that passage a lot better because you simply know the exact movements that need to happen as opposed to sort of just jumping in and playing everything on autopilot. And there you go, we've come to the end of the five beginner piano bad habits just sort of goes to waste. Hi, my name is Jazer. I play the piano. In this video, I want to share with you a method that I use to learn pieces in days. Not weeks, not months, but these days I can learn pieces in days. Not because I am any smarter, but it's more because I have a great method. In this video, it's gonna be a little bit different in that I'm not gonna be playing too much piano, but I'm actually gonna be talking and discussing deeply about the strategy of practice. My advice to you is to try to digest what I'm saying. You may not agree or see the value of it right away, but try to utilize this method for one day, two days, maybe even a week, and you're gonna see some huge results. What is the deep sections method? The basic idea is this, you're gonna be creating mini sections in your piece to practice as opposed to playing through the entire piece. These mini sections can be eight bars, four bars, two bars, one bar, sometimes even less than one bar. The idea is you're gonna be repeating these mini sections for seven times. And here's the catch. The seven times that they have to be 110% perfect. That means you're not allowed to make the slightest bit of error. Let's jump into a quick example. I'm gonna use the Mozart Sonata in C. So in this piece, let's say that we are gonna create our very first mini sections for the first two bars of the music. So what I'll do is I'll repeat this section four, seven times. And remember, they have to be 100% successful. Once I successfully do it every time, I have this weird quirk that I do. I really enjoy doing it. Um, and that is that I'll just say out the number. I'll say one, and then I'll go for my next one. Two. Three. You might be wondering why seven times? I personally find that seven times is a good number between actually good deep work and also not so many times that it becomes a bit too boring. In the deep sections method, there are two things to remember. The first thing is that you will not need the pedal. So I advise against using the pedal for this method because pedal adds another layer of coordination that you simply don't need when you are starting to learn a fresh piece. You should focus entirely on your two hands and your 10 fingers and which notes to press correctly for the start. The second thing to remember in the deep sections method is something that may not be so intuitive for some of you, but it is that rhythm doesn't matter in this practice. Let me demonstrate what I mean. So if you need to do this, and you need some time to find this next pattern, let's say you need to find time here, for me, that still counts as a successful time. So if you play what you just heard, something like this. I still count that as a successful time. I would actually much rather you do something like this compared to this. When I see students playing and practicing like this, I think it's a bit of a waste of time because it's a little bit like gambling. It sort of feels like you don't really know what the next note is and you're just gambling and trying your luck with what the next note is. So and whenever you do something like this, 
it shows me that you are not 100% secure about what the next thing is. So in this deep sections method, what I'm more interested for you to do is to just take all the time you need. You can just pause there and get your fingers moved to the actual correct spot before you strike it. That's what's more important for me. So to reiterate, you can do something like this. This is perfectly fine. Pause a bit to think. For every little section that you feel is not 100% confident, you can just slow it down, take your time to think about what the next thing is before you strike it. Because each time you do something correctly, you're actually then learning something. Your fingers go, oh, that's how to do it. Then you learn something great, right? And if you repeat that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, now you're really starting to understand how that part actually works instead of taking a chance and gambling on what the next notes are. One of the other parts that students often make mistakes in this piece is in bar 18. Just another section to demonstrate the deep sections method again. So in this one, you can do something like this. So let's say I want to do, instead of this four bar progression, I want to split it into smaller sections. For example. Okay, maybe we just do that. We just do one bar and we're gonna work on this very, very deeply. And you can even do something like this. Find your position. Find your position. This is much better than something like this, where I see a lot of students do. Sort of just gambling and not being 1000% sure what the next note is. I'd rather you do something like this. Pause. Think first. Okay, and that counts as one. And I'll do my second time now. two, and so on and so forth. Keep doing it until seven. I've gotten a lot of my students to try the deep sections method and they really love it. On service level, it can kind of seem like, whoa, Jaser, this seems like a really boring method to practice. But if you were to try this method, you'll find that it's actually a really fun thing to do because you can try to think about it as a game. So let's say each note is kind of like, let's say a coin in Mario, right? And you're trying to get all the coins. Think about every single note as it is a required coin to get. And if you don't get it, then you have to restart. What my students tell me when they do the deep sections method, whether it's in the lesson or at home, is that they tell me that their reflection is they used to think they knew the parts, but after doing the deep sections method, they realized they didn't know the part as well as they thought they did. And after doing it, they now felt like it was, they knew the passages in their hands and they were so much more secure and they feared the parts much less because they've practiced it and there is a muscle memory to it, there is an oral memory to it. It's a lot more secure. I recommend you to try this deep sections method and let me know in the comments next time if you have achieved any good results from it. In summary, we should never ever play and practice a piece from the start to the finish. The return on investment of that method is very, really low. You're not gonna get much good work out of that, but rather you should create small sections to practice in your piece. In summary, here are the few pointers for how to do the deep sections method. Create small sections on the piece to practice. They can be eight, four, two, one, even half a bar. You will practice them for seven successful times. So even if you make the slightest bit of error, you actually have to restart again. You will not need to use the pedal and the rhythm doesn't matter for now. It's more important to try to prepare and get every single note right. And then just proceed to move on to each new next section once you finish your seven successful times. What you'll realize after doing this for a couple of days is that these sections are gonna start to get really, really secure. And then you can start to expand your sections. So instead of the previous section being two bars, you can now expand to let's say four bars. And then once those four bars are perfected, you can move on to then eight. And then before you know it, you're, you're basically playing each full page pretty perfectly. Tip number one is to practice pieces that you love. I know this sounds like common sense, but 
really make it a point to pay attention to this one. owe it to yourself to do some research on the pieces that you will love to practice and work towards in the next couple of months or years. We live in the age of YouTube and Spotify now where all this music is so readily available. I recommend you to create a playlist of 10 to 20 pieces that you really want to aim to play. Check them off one by one, always go back to them and get inspired by them. Tip number two for staying motivated is to track your progress. I personally track my progress in a couple of ways. I keep a journal for myself. This kind of contains everything from my daily thoughts to my practice progress. It's probably a little hard to read here from the camera, but I put notes on the bars I need to work on and the different phrases I need to get better at etc etc for me there's something just so amazing about writing notes down and tracking my progress day after day week after week i recommend you to also get yourself a practice journal another way i track my progress is through the forest app this is not a sponsored ad or anything i just love them so much i've been using it for about a year the idea is you set a timer for let's say 10 20 minutes and you click on plant and the tree actually starts to grow. And you're not allowed to leave the app because the moment you do that, the tree dies and you don't want that because you don't want that dead tree to appear in your forest. It just doesn't look really good. If you complete that 10 or 20 minutes, the tree blossoms and then you know you have this nice little tree in your forest. And over time, you just built this very nice looking forest. I love this app. It gamifies my practice and it just keeps me motivated. Tip number three to stay motivated is to learn from a piano teacher. I've gotten most of my piano gains by working with a mentor or a teacher for two reasons. The first thing is that there is money on the line. Because I'm paying the teacher, I feel like I'm using my own resources to improve myself. I'm just motivated by not wanting to waste any money. So I practice hard as a result. Second reason why I think learning from a teacher is a good idea is because especially when you find a teacher that you really respect and like. You don't want to disappoint your teacher. It's always a nice feeling to rock up to your lesson, whether that's face-to-face -face or online, you know, doing a good job and have your teacher say, wow, well done. So from that perspective of, you know, wanting the, let's say the approval or the respect from another human, it can really motivate you to practice. Fourth tip for today is to find an optimal time in the day to practice. Now, every person watching this video will have a slightly different answer but some people prefer to practice in the morning, some afternoon, some night. I used to practice a lot in the night, not due to any particular reason. I just sort of did it because it was my habit, but I was always tired and never felt like the practice was that good. Ever since about two years ago, I started to practice in the morning. Now, I don't know what it's like for you, but I love practicing in the morning. I just feel like my brain is such a better sponge in the morning. It can retain and absorb things so much better. I feel like 30 minutes of practice in the morning is equivalent to like one and a half hours in the evening. It's just a time in the day where my brain just functions a lot better, especially after a coffee. Everyone here will be a little bit different, but the principle here is you should experiment with practicing piano at different times of the day to see which fits you the best. And while we're on this note, let's also quickly talk about your environment. Is the piano or keyboard placed in a part of the house that is suitable for practice? Is it quiet or is there a bunch of distractions around you? If possible, place your piano or keyboard in a part of a house that's actually quiet and gives you some space to think and practice in peace. Tip number five for today is to listen to recordings that inspire you. This fifth one is a huge one for me. Whenever I have any motivation or slums, I realize it's normally because I haven't heard any good music recently. Normally when you listen to some really awesome music on Spotify or YouTube, there's just this rush of emotions that completely overwhelm me and gets me right back into the piano again. So I really recommend you also put in that research to find some recordings that really motivate you and really make sure you listen to them to stay inspired. And there you go, those were five tips for you to stay motivated with piano. Practice pieces you love, track your progress, learn from a teacher, find an optimal time to practice, and listen to recordings that inspire you. If you have any thoughts or comments about these five tips, let me know in the comments below. That's all the time we have for today. 
catch you in the next piano tutorial video.